So the Enneagram, maybe some of you have heard, is an ancient system. And um, I'm going to take you briefly to from where, how it originated, how you got that diagram, which, which you've probably seen before, and how that diagram can um, be useful to us today. So I'm going to start right at the beginning. So since the beginning of time, humanity has always looked to the stars for guidance. Before there was lights, before there was mobile phones or computers or anything to distract you at night, people would look up to the sky and look at the stars. And what they would see in the stars, they would see the moon. So what we have here is the, the different phases of the moon, the 28 different phases of the moon, <coughs> from new moon to, to full moon, crescent moon, and so on. So they would see that the moon was slightly different every day. And the moon tells the passage of time, and they needed to understand the skies, they needed to understand the moon, because they didn't know how to plant crops, you know, the seasons, you know, how to cross the ocean, when is it going to flood, flood? They needed to look to the stars for guidance. And when they were looking at the stars, they may have came across these two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, which are visible for, in, for the naked eye. These two planets are the most expansive and contractive planets, and the largest planets. So Jupiter, most expansive, Saturn, the most contractive. And every year, they will meet three times. And every 20 years, they'll meet three times. They'll form, over a 60-year period, three equilateral triangles. So that, that's amazing. Like if, when I first knew about this, it's like there's some there's this pattern that forms in the sky from Jupiter and Saturn. You can track these uh, these these um, two planets, and um, the Magi, which were known in the fifth century around the Middle East, were known for their astronomical abilities. And they said like the, the three Magi who went to visit at the birth <coughs> of Jesus, they followed this bright star. Um, some some uh, astrologers have traced this back to a triple meeting of Jupiter and Saturn, and the source of this information are Keith Crishlow, Time Standstill, and Michael Molnar, the star of Bethlehem. So the stars were very important in the old times. So how did the Enneagram evolve from there? So we're going to now look back at um, this. A uh, hermit called Pontius Evagrius, who lived 345 to 399 AD. So he grew up in Turkey, uh, Pontius Evagrius, where the Magi were. Um, they, these were ast known astronomers, astrologers of the time. And he's someone who believed that all creation was a metaphor. There was something in, in the world around him that, that spoke about the existence, the human existence. So he left Constantinople in Greece for. Nitria in 383 AD to live with the f desert fathers and find peace. So I don't think, I don't think this quite shows up, but anyway, he, he was he, he lived, um, he moved from Constantinople up here down to the desert of Nitria. He lived in these places, they were called hermitages, they lived in like caves. He had heard of uh, uh, people who were the desert fathers who had gone out to find peace. Because at the time, Christianity had just um, been taken over uh, under Roman rule, and he he wanted to move away from the big cities to to f to to search a new way of life, a new meaning of life. So he went off to the desert where the, these desert fathers lived in in, in places like this. Um, and this this location um, was a short distance from Alexandria, which was the wealthiest city in the ancient world. So around this this place. Um, he was known as a kind, hospitable man. People would come to him and he would talk to them for all night and he would talk to them for days and the visitors who came to visit the Hermitage. And at the same time, because there was, there, was, there was a lot of space in the desert, people had gone there to search for something different from the, the busy city life. And there was a lot of stars in the sky. So he was, uh, he studied the monks in the desert. He also was familiar with the uh, Astronomy, and he wrote a book, Vice is Opposed to Virtues. In this book, he interviewed the monks, and he, he noticed that there were eight different types of monks, and he was looking at what were their obstacles to, to a spiritual experience, what were their obstacles to prayer, and he came across there were eight <coughs> different types of people. These, these things which they would struggle with, such as like, um, you know, anger, gluttony, envy, so on, became later known as the seven deadly sins, which took place in, in the, much of the Christian world after that. Um, but he was one of the, 
the, the forerunners of this type of ideas. He would interview monks, he'd kind of study their personality, he would study them. And he wrote, um, you can read about his books online, it's in Greek, but it's translated to, to English. Uh, a lot of it is published online. So he was also at the same time, he was familiar with Greek geometry. He was familiar with Pythagoras, which lived around 500 BC, the Platonic solids of, of Plato in 400 BC, and Euclidean geometry in, in 300 BC. So he also wrote about the, the significance of triangles, hexagons, and circles, all which <coughs> will, will form the makeup of the modern Enneagram. So he, he was someone which kind of looked for the ultimate meaning of life, trying to look at Every combined the different schools of thought that were in Alexandria at the time, which had the largest library in the world. Um, a lot of the, the collective wisdom from the east and the north and west were kind of in, in one place. Um, he was also familiar with the number nine, and the number nine is very significant. The Enneagram there's nine different types. So the number nine is used around ma major religions around the world. It's a sacred number. You have nine aspects of deity, the nine muses in Greek, nine Celtic gods, nine Egyptian gods. And, and so on. So we're going to fast forward another about a thousand years because there, there wasn't too much written uh, about that since uh, Pontius Regus. But you can envisage that the work he had done would be spreading around this region and around the, the whole of uh, the Middle East, around the, the churches there. So the next char character is Ramon Lau. Um, he's a Franciscan. So now we look at what we have here. It's, it's a lot closer to the Enneagram diagram we have today. Porsche Vegas did not actually create the diagram as such, but he was trying to work with circles, hexagons, and triangles, and, and trying to find the meaning behind those. He never quite got into the Enneagram in its current form. Ramon Lau, on the other hand, has an Enneagram diagram. So he, he, has the, he already has the nine different points on it, number B to K. He puts A in the middle, and A was what was put in the middle, he put it as God in the middle. Um, nine qualities of God, so it's nine is God's essence in the center. And so if we look at Enya, Enya in Greek means nine, <coughs> and Gram means point, so there's nine different points. So you have a very rudimentary, primitive, early form of the Enneagram that is not quite what we have today, but it's moving in that direction. So now how did the Enneagram evolve into what it is today? So let's look at some of the more modern history. So this is a very key character in the modern Enneagram, George Gurdjieff, lived 1866 to 1949. So he was a philosopher, psychologist of Armenian Greek descent. Um, he studied to be a Russian Orthodox priest, but he left and traveled for around 20 years. He went all around Egypt, India, Tibet in search of wisdom. He, wanted to, he went to different monasteries, he wanted to combine many, many different schools of thought. So he supposedly encountered the Enneagram in a Sufi monastery in Afghanistan and brought it back to Russia in 1912. So who, who are the Sufis? The Sufis were um, people who were sought to deepen themselves in God's love through prayer and meditation. <coughs> uh, their ideas, where they were based in the Middle East, uh, were also significantly impacted by the church des desert fathers like Pontius de Vigris. So even today, I mean, I've, I watched a documentary on this, you can see um, there are Sufis who go into to, um, churches and pray to with, uh, with statues and, and um, light candles. So there's a very um, pacifist form of religion there. They play a lot of music, they dance, they kind of um, doesn't really there isn't that distinguishing you know, between Islam and Christianity and so on. They're kind of all embracing um, culture that they lived in. So Gurdjieff, he brought back the Enneagram. He taught the Enneagram as a secret knowledge. He was someone who believed that the Enneagram um, could not be taught unless by someone who is in the know. And to some extent, I do agree with him because the Enneagram is really powerful knowledge. If you know and understand the Enneagram, you really understand a lot about human behavior, which can be used for good, but it can be used for also a lot of very not good things. So it's, the knowledge is very powerful. It's very heavy, which is at the same time, I'm also mindful of this. I mean, it's taken me a long while to kind of refine my ideas to reach a stage where I can feel comfortable enough to share this with the public. Because in a sense, this secret knowledge is something that, that could destroy you. And um, people have kind of, you know, gone very far with it, not how it's meant to be used. So I want to try and present it in a way that it can be used for your good and your for benefit and not something that it could, uh, you could take away and kind of mess with your mind. 
But interesting to note is that Gurdjieff did not use the Enneagram for psychological types. Those nine types we see today, he did not come up with those types. But what he did come up with was this triangle diagram here, the law of three and law of seven. So this is a very similar diagram. In fact, it's the same diagram that's used in the Enneagram um, today. A lot of the modern Enneagram teachers use the George Gurdjieff Enneagram, call it the process Enneagram. Um, his contribution was the diagram um, in this current form. So the next character in the modern history is Oscar Chazo. He's still living today, born in 1931. So he's a philosopher, psychologist, and he started the Erica School in Chile. He's also someone who wanted to explore different ideas and thoughts, and he wanted to combine them all together. He also traveled to the Middle East. He spent time with the Kabbalah, um, Sufis, and he, and he came back after his travels to Chile, and he combined everything he had learned together. So it's supposedly in, in a stroke of genius, he combined the the seven deadly sins plus two, which Pontius Avagius, the first person we talked about, has came up with. And he placed these nine different sins, we should call them, on the, the Enneagram, the, the Gurdjieff Enneagram. And he did them in the right order, um, which is very significant. Because at, at the same time, um, supposedly, you know, everyone struggles with all nine of the, the, the sins, but there's one sin that one per the person will struggle with the most, and that's what forms the foundation of type. So he um, he was one of the most significant uh, contributors to the modern Enneagram. So the next character is Claudio Nerano, uh, born 1932. He's still alive today. Um, he's a psychiatrist, of, also of Chilean origin. Uh, he was studying Gertrude's studies at Esalen in California. And in 1970, his son died in Chile. He went over um, to Chile. Um, he, at, that, at that point in time, he <coughs> coincidentally uh, popped into Oshkosh and Charles' school. Uh, he learned the Enneagram from him, and he brought it back to the U.S. Um, and he also introduced panels as a form of teaching. So if you look at Kevin Nerano, he taught the Enneagram to Helen Palmer, which you saw in the earlier slide. Was where I learned the Enneagram in California. It originated in in the, in the Western world in California around the early 70s. Um, she she later taught it to Dr. David Daniels. So the Enneagram today, uh, newer biology, and this is Dr. David Daniels, born 1984. As I mentioned, he passed away earlier this year. He was former professor of psychiatry and behavioral science at Stanford University. So now we see the Enneagram has moved from you know, from the stars to the, the, the Desert Fathers to the modern day uh, philosophers, psychologists. And now it's been moved, in, uh, it's been, the work has <coughs> progressed even further. And Dr. Daniels has been working with it for about 30 years. He's looked at the different centers of intelligence, um, the mind, the heart, and the body. And um, there are three centers of intelligence found in every human being. There's a three-centered brain. And the brain is, is a pattern recognition machine. So you think about it, all these motor neurons are firing in the brain. If there wasn't any patterns in your brain, how would you be able to remember how to get to work the next day? It would be a disaster. So the brain is always forming patterns, and these patterns have been um, recognized in neurobiology and neuroscience has, has, has understands how these, these patterns are being formed. So I'm you know, not an expert on this, but again, this I'm just sharing with you what some of the key key points to note from uh, neurobiology. So you, there's a three-centered brain, the head, the heart, and the body. And the head is the neocortex. A lot of work has been done in psych psychology and psychiatry the last hundred years, you know, where there's Freud or Jung. It's uh, from the front, the neocortex, how the mind functions. And there's a lot of emphasis on that, you know, what can I learn? Where, what, what can I do? How, make sense of it? The next is, is the heart center. It's, it's, it's linked to the emotional center. Um, it's sort of the limbic and mammalian brain, and a lot of um, all mammals have this. It's linked to the question, am I loved? And the body is the instinctual center down in the belly. Um, reptilian brain is called, it's linked to how you feel safe in the world. So the Enneagram today is about developing self-awareness. It's about the, developing the ability to stop, reflect, develop your inner observer. And when you do this, you actually gain awareness to all three centers of awareness, your mind, 
your heart and your body. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about these three centers a little bit more. So the base three main emotions that we looked at are fear, distress, and anger, which are linked to the three centers. They happen in, in all mammals. And even though they have positive benefits to help us survive in the world, um, these negative emotions or adverse emotions have more power than positive emotions. It's measured that these emotions have up to 10 times more power than, than uh, positive emotions. So it's no wonder we're trying to avoid them. And so adaptive strategy and, and what you learn and develop into each of the nine types, it becomes actually a type structure. The structure is there to prevent you from experiencing these emotions that can cause you pain. So, it's, uh, you've probably seen a cat when it's very scared. If you go up to a cat, you get a hissing and an arch back. The cat has fear kind of scared of you. So the way they puff self up to make self look bigger, less less of a less of a as a fear aggression um, response to external stimuli. The head center is, is also known as um, helping to figure things out. They help you to know things. There's wisdom and knowledge and intelligence in the head center. So, so at the same time there's understanding. Um, and when if we feel afraid, when we feel unsafe, we're uncertain about the future, when we're just unsure about where, where to go next. At the same time, when it's a sense it's a threat, being in, endangered, um, we kind of try and figure out what the next, the best path is. And the head center is also known for seeing. It's like the, the phrase, your mind's eye, so the, the mind is, is there for seeing. The next center is the heart center. So all mammals have this. You have, you have gorilla close, feeling the love of his baby. The baby feels secure um, in the arms of a gorilla. The mammal, mammalian brain is linked, to, um, is linked to being connected and being bonded, loved, touched. And it's something when we lose connectedness, we've become distressed. And experiments have been done with mice. So you, you take a baby mice and you put it far away from its mother and, and the other group of mice, the mouse is going to start screaming and, and start crying very loud. There's a, there's a distress associated between separation from people, so, uh, for, for us and from, of all mammals being separated from their pack. So it's, distress is something you don't want to feel. It's a very strong negative emotion. It's also the heart center's linked to doing, um, taking action. The next um, strong emotion of the three centers is anger is linked to the body it's how you get in the world so these these lines are fighting for space for pride for respect who's going to be the 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 biggest strongest lion so so lions are very interesting like the male lions would when they go and find a new pack they would try and kill all the male cubs of a female of other females of, of yeah, of all the male cubs there because it's not its offspring there's no need to to share its genes to the to them and so on. So they will actually kill the small cubs. So there, there's a scarcity of um, male small lions in, in the in in the world. So the, at the same time, for us, body is about how we occupy our space. And we we get angry when we don't get respected or treated as worthy. And when you're going to get what you need for survival, when you get your food or, secure, or hung, uh, when you're hungry, you get you get angry. Um, the body center at the same time is linked for being. It's about being present and, and taking up space and how you show up in the world that way. So the Enneagram is about learning to work with all three centers that all human beings have and learning how to integrate them so we can become more balanced and complete as individuals. So I'd just like to sum up right now as to where we got with the Enneagram. Um, so the Enneagram has ancient origins based on sacred geometry, where it is from the stars, Jupiter and Saturn, from the pyramids, Pythagoras or Euclidean geometry. It's something that has evolved over time. And the question I'd like to pose to you is that, is there something in the stars and in nature that can give us clues as to our human existence? And in the last few decades, Schools like the Enneagram in the narrative tradition, where I studied, 
have continued research into the Enneagram, and panels of interviews with thousands and thousands of people have confirmed the existence of the nine types. And these panels have been done all around the world, so whichever country or geography people are in, it would naturally correspond to one of the nine types. So at the same time, the last couple of decades have seen developments in neuroscience supporting the structure of the three-centered brain. And the patterns of human behavior detailed by Pontius and Vagrus in the 4th century are also universal patterns that exist today. So understanding the Enneagram and the nature of our own human existence continues to evolve today. It's used in business, that many Fortune 500 companies use the Enneagram. In one-to-one, -one, in therapy, counseling and coaching, spiritual direction too. It's also used to help reform society, and the Enneagram Prison Project is one such project in which the incarcerated learn about the Enneagram in order to help them reintegrate back into society. And lastly, the Enneagram can also be used for personal development whether it's learning how to be a better person or working with your own spirituality.